Welcome back to 755 is Real. I'm David O'Brien, Braves writer at The Athletic, with my co-host, Eric O'Flaherty, former Braves reliever extraordinaire. Eric, you missed that scene behind me? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Every year, every year this time of year, you know, you're in your shitty weather up up north and you know, it's not get shitty to, here, man. I know you get to duck out and it's 70 degrees every day and sunny. I miss it's that. Like we, we got up to 80, I think today, and it's not yet humid and we got a nice breeze. So, and they did a hell of a job fixing this place after the hurricane. I heard the hurricane did $10 million in damage. You'd never know. The only thing is like a couple of signs, like the one on top of the scoreboard and the one yeah. over the bar in left field. They were still replacing those. But as far as the physical structure, man, because they had like a foot of water in the clubhouses. I hate that. They had to redo that. They had to redo the press box, bunch of stuff. I mean, hell of a job. The bent screens. I heard one of those massive light poles, concrete light poles, slightly moved, massive thing. And they had to fix that. So anyway, yeah. place looks great. Braves had their first uh, pitchers and catchers workout today. You know, even when you were playing, as you got at, towards the end of your career, you were seeing a difference in the number of people that got there early, right? I mean, it's not like it used to be yeah. where everybody gets there today. They've all been here almost. Almost all of them have been here for a few days. Yeah, that probably started like 2010, 11, 12, in that range. It was like if you weren't there early, it was kind of starting to get – it would get looked like, you yeah. know, like maybe you weren't that invested. You didn't care. Right. You weren't trying that hard. You know, I mean, it's all I watched. The guys will be working their asses off at home and, and show up when they do, but – um, it it kind of started to get viewed that way. And you'd see, you know, 70, 80 percent of guys that were supposed to be there on reporting day were there two, three weeks yeah. early. Yeah. And not only do they show up early, but nowadays everybody shows up ready in to shape. go in shape. Yeah. Nobody works themselves into shape like they used to. When I first started, these guys would show up. Some would be a little bit overweight. You know, they just work themselves into condition over the six, seven weeks we're here. But now they all show up, look like they're ready to open for opening day. <laughs> Well, that's like that quote Lance Berkman had. It's like, you know, can we all just stop working out that nobody has to? You know, the, the bar kind of started getting yeah. set where everybody comes into camp ready to go. Yeah. You know, if you can't be coming into camp throwing 82, getting your arm into shape when the rest of the guys are showing up throwing 100 already. You know, it's glaring. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so glaring what kind of offseason you put in now. So they're all here. Um, all the pitch and catches are here and a most of the position guys got here a yep. couple of days ago, a few more today, but they're the whole, I think the whole position, the whole lineup is here. Yeah. I mean, from Matt Olson to Austin Riley, Ozzy's been here for, since I got here, at least might've got here. He might've got here before me. Uh, Acuna got here early. Um, all the left fielders and they have a shit ton of them, man, that are competing for left field. Right. Snit said we might have to do it on two fields. We're gonna have like eight guys out there in left field taking fly balls and everything. So yeah. But uh all in all, impressions the first few days. I mean, just what you can get from watching some guys hit, that kind of thing. Really impressive. I haven't gone back and watched guys throw yet because it's not really been important until you know now. But but watching the guys hit in a cage, the main guys. Uh, I wrote it today, but Michael Harris really stands out, man. And Acuna, does he? How's he Acuna stand last out? year, Acuna last year, you know, he had trouble with that knee sometimes where he felt either it was physically, it was hurting. And also yeah. mentally, he was kind of scared to rotate fully because it was bothering him. You know, it's the first time he's ever been hurt. And he's kind of worried probably that he's going to re-injure. Yep. No sign of that this year. He said he feels great. He's getting the same power that you're used to seeing from him. But Harris, though. Dude, he's about – he's he's 225 now. He's about six feet tall. He's 225, and he played at 210, 215 last year, and it's all muscle. His yeah. legs – I don't know. Remember Robert Newhouse with the Cowboys, the fullback? But he looks like a fullback. He looks like a fullback right now with the, with the legs and the thighs. And upper body, no fat at all. I mean, no, like, bulk muscle. He's just right. bigger. It's bigger biceps, more wiry. Uh, just uh he's a specimen and he's he's hitting oppo home runs just with that swing of his looks so smooth and effortless and then it, yeah. and then the next pitch he's just pulling line drive to right field dunk off the fence you know the metal fence he's uh i think this kid could be poised to do some really big things a year two i know a lot of people were worried because his left-handed numbers last year weren't good because his right-handed numbers were so great that his final numbers were really strong yeah 
135 OPS plus, but it's lefty numbers. I think he'll come around with that, you know. Well, you're not going to learn. You know, I mean, you're not going to learn in in double A AA or triple A how to hit elite lefties. Right. And he hadn't even played triple A, played like yeah. 40 games in double A and came up straight yeah. to the big leagues at 21 so years old. That's a huge jump. And that's, that is one of the biggest areas that you grow, I think, is in triple A, you know, that, that step, especially like lefty, lefty, um, yeah. you're, you're facing the the lefty relievers that aren't quite good enough and the lefty starters that aren't yeah. quite good enough, but they're able to get the lefties out. So you, you're able to actually face some of those guys that have like the getting lefties out down, but maybe they're working on a change up or trying yeah. to figure out how to combat righties, but they already got lefties handled. So when you stop in triple A as a prospect coming up, you kind of get beat up by those lefties with the dynamite slider that don't have a change up. Those those type of guys and skipping that whole step and going straight to the big leagues. I mean, that's a big jump. But for me, I mean, he he hit a lefty. I don't remember the guy's name, but there's a dude on the Marlins throwing 99 and he took him opposite field. Yeah. Yeah, he showed some encouraging signs he toward hit, the end. He got two knocks off of Alvarado, who's throwing 99 with sink. You know, it's I don't think he's yep. overwhelmed by the angle. It's just a matter of getting the reps against uh, the the top end major league left-handed arms that, that you can't practice at triple a. Yeah. Because like you said, in double a, if there's a good left-hander, he's not going to be in double a, no. they're going to move him up. No, no. So and when, when I was in double a, I faced this guy, Walter young. And uh, he, I think he'd had some time with the Padres, but I had this cutter that I threw to lefties and it was just the angle, the angle itself, uh, you know, the double A guys were just missing it, popping it up, and it, it phased them. You know, I, it was just a get out of jail free card because I had yeah. a tough angle. It was a quality pitch with tight movement, and nine out of 10 of them, it didn't matter where I threw it. And he was the first lefty I remember, and it's because he'd been in the big leagues. I threw him one kind of hard of the plate, you know, at the knees, and it did nothing to him. He just shit on it to left center. Yeah. It's like, I, okay, I've seen this type of stuff in the big leagues. But all the double-A guys, you know, it, everybody's kind of climbing and, and you can't learn to beat something or adjust to it until you see it. And you just – you don't see a lot of it in in double-A. And when you do see it, it's like, you know, you, you saw it last Tuesday and then you see it again next next Wednesday. You're not seeing it. That, when you get called to the major leagues, you're going to see one of those lefties almost every night. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to see a specialist, no doubt, especially if, if you show you can hit. Yeah. Um. Other thing, this guy, they, the left field candidates are all impressive physically, man. I mean, I'm sure they got themselves in great shape because they come in, they know what they got to do to yeah. win a job. But like Eli White, I would heard he could run. He was great defensively. And you look at him and you're going, yeah, I see that. I mean, he's put <laughs> together. Wiry dude. Uh, the guy from uh, the, the Hilliard, the, the sign from the Rockies, the former Rockies, he's like 6'5", 235. Rosario looks good, man. Got his hair. It's got like a faux hawk and it's dyed like a yellow greenish color because all the Puerto Rican players are doing that for WBC. Yeah. But he's looked good in batting cage. Rosario looks good. I mean, he looks like you can't really tell much from the batting cage, but um, he sure looks good physically. Uh, Ozuna, have not seen him. He's the only guy I have not seen, <laughs> which none of us are surprised either. Right. He's not one that shows up early if he doesn't have to. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, same concept with that. If he had 55 homers last year, yeah, he'd still be showing up the same time yeah. he's showing up when he had a tough season. And it's like, it is what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone knows why he's on the team and all that. He's going to get a chance to hit. <laughs> yeah. If he hits, he'll be in the lineup. Yep. So I mean, that's what it boils he, down to. Doesn't matter I, if he gets here yesterday or last week. That's not going to affect anything as far as. I think that stuff, you know, obviously a lot of the stuff helps perception and it's, it's definitely good for guys without guaranteed jobs right. to show up and put that work in and just let coaches start getting a look at you and, and show that you're, you know, you're doing everything you can to make the team. But yeah. in the end, you either hit or you pitch or you don't. And it would look good for him to be here yeah. when we got here and working hard and talking a lot to the young players and all that. But you know what? Ozuna he, has been known yep. not to do the right thing from time yep. to time. How about he can show up hit he can show up weighing 285 and if he's crushing he balls, is. nobody will care. be happy. Yeah. Yeah. So but uh overall, I would say uh and it's just it, it really is crazy or amazing that or impressive what Alex does every year, bringing in guys that 
you could just tell are good guys. And and, yeah. and the chemistry, you walk in the club, it feels like you're walking in midseason. There's hardly anybody sitting there alone like a new guy at his locker with a phone out, you know, on a, a, nobody wants to talk to or he's scared to talk to anybody. Everybody's talking to people already. These new guys yeah. I've never seen before. And they're like in groups talking to each other. It's yep. pretty impressive to be here and see that so early. And every guy I talked to, newcomers, said they were blown away so far by the family atmosphere and the chemistry. Like I talked to Lukey, who came from the Yankees, 34, 35 yeah. years old. He said, it's been awesome. He said, just being here, being around the guys, getting to know so many of them, he said, it's just that you can see what everybody talks about with the chemistry and all that. It's cool they have that, you know, I mean, because that, that gets around the league and then you yeah. see it for yourself. But it really makes a difference, especially in the position of guys showing up, you know, from other organizations trying to make a team. Yeah. Trying to establish yourself. You know, for, for me personally, when I came over from Seattle, it was like I didn't know it could be like this. And it, the comfort level I had right away, just getting to know guys and everybody being friendly. You know, I mean, I think that made a big difference in the entire trajectory of my career. He. uh it's funny. I asked him about, I said, were you as surprised as a lot of us were when the Yankees DFA you? Cause he had two really good years, great years, man. His best years of his career. Uh, but you know, he throws like 86, 87 and yeah. the Yankees like to have those power arms. And he said, I wasn't really surprised. Cause I could kind of see, he goes, I was surprised, but I could see they were signing guys like judge and they signed somebody else. He named it. I knew they were going to have to make moves, but yeah, oh, yeah he, he had said, some good seasons. Dude, his numbers are great. Back yeah. to back years with really good numbers. Um, and he said when Cashman's name come up on his phone, he's like, uh oh, he goes, that can't be backing. good. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Cashman's name on his phone. He answered it. He told him, Yeah, we've been DFA'd. Yeah, he's yeah, not yeah, the we, kind of guy they're calling to see about a move they're thinking about making. Right. And it's right before Christmas. Yeah. So, goes, so I had a great Christmas holiday explaining to my family and everything what was going on, where I was going to be next year, or how I didn't know where I was going to be next year. And, and the thing was, he had 10 days, but there's so many off days or dead days during holidays it that he goes, it could have like been up to two and a half weeks yeah. if they wanted to take that long to do it. So it was just a terrible time for it to happen, but it didn't take nearly that long. And so Cashman's name came up again, and it was him telling him you're trading him to the Braves. So he's like, when I found out where I was going, he said that was that was yeah. a really good place to land. Yeah. So he uh another one another one something happened that I've never had happen before. We were like four or five of us, three riders, a couple of radio or a couple of TV people were here. And Eli White walks in, a guy from the Rangers, left field candidate. He's been with the Rangers, I think, his whole career. It's the first time he switched teams, I think. Um uh, he walks in and I thought maybe he mistook us for, for some club official or something because he walks up to us. On it. We didn't say anything to him. He walks up to us. He goes, hi, I'm Eli. Dead serious, man. He goes to each of us. Hi, I'm Eli. I'm Eli. We introduced ourselves. And I was like, that's never happened. I have never <laughs> seen that happen. <laughs> the guy walks in, uh, you know, it's the first time he's changed teams and he's going to get off the right foot. Whoever it is, he's going to introduce himself. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. That pretty is cool. cool. But, um, I, I I would say that uh, when you talk to the guys about last year, the, especially the, especially some of the guys that were had experienced the World Series and and are, are like in Ian Anderson's case who, who had to watch from home after having two great postseasons, how it ended last year really drove has drove a lot of people. Guys that struggled yeah. or were hurt during during you know and like uh, and like uh, Strider, you know what was obviously had not pitched in almost a month and struggled after that second inning. Uh, those guys, they really, it really hurt them. You could tell that they didn't go any yeah. further. And Ian said, you know, you know, he has the oblique has to shut it down. No chance to, to, if he, if he had any chance to rejoin the team for the postseason, that ended with the oblique. Uh, and that was legit. He had to come down and rehab that thing for a while after the season, but he said, watching at home, it's hard. He goes, cause I had to feel like I, maybe I could help, you know, cause of what he'd done yeah. in the postseason before, but there were a lot of cases of that where, where what happened in, in that first round loss. Um, and then seeing the Phillies go all the way to the world series. Yep. Really drove a lot of these guys. So I think it, uh, I, I think a lot of maybe, maybe the workouts in the off season were, were turned up a little bit, maybe more than they would have been, but you know, not, maybe not with the veteran guys, but some of the younger guys that really wanted to go back there and experience it. 
Uh, even just the hunger, you know, I mean, it's, it's something you can't manufacture, uh, you know, like the chip on your shoulder type of stuff, uh, the target on your back, all these things. There's just certain ways you respond to them that you can't fake and get knocked out of the playoffs like that when you're thinking we're going deep. But, you know, I mean, it's just going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. And when it's Monday morning, maybe you had a long weekend and you got your workout planned for 7 a.m., you're not pushing that thing back to 930 yeah. You know, it's like you just you, you that extra little drive and being pissed off and having something to prove. Uh, I mean, it's it's crazy the way it can push you. I remember I, I was um when I was like 19 or something, I was working at this athletic store and I'd left and I came back in. And the lady that was there, the boss was she was saying something about me, like, what's this guy going to what's he going to do with his life or something along those lines? You know, because obviously baseball is not going to work out was the, the tone she had. Yeah. And that that pissed me off so bad. I rode that and I was still thinking about her all the way until my big league debut. So two full <laughs> seasons of working my ass off just to prove this this lady wrong, you know. So it, it's crazy what one little thing can can kind of do to you. And like Strider's bad start, you know, how much uh, fire you can pull from that failure right there. Yeah. And when you succeed, you know, it's you, you don't you don't get those things. It, that's the hardest thing is to keep succeeding when things are going your way because you get everybody gets fat and happy. Yeah, that dude looks in great shape, by the way, Strider. I talked to him yeah. a little bit this morning, and uh, yeah, he's ready. Um, <laughs> I, I I couldn't. I had uh, Von Grissom, who I think is a night nice guy, but maybe he's maybe he doesn't have a long deal. Maybe he's listening to some other ones, but it, some other companies. But you could tell he's. He's a he's a potential great sign for a shoe company. You know, he might be the shortstop for the Braves. I go before he got here this morning. I counted the boxes <laughs> at his locker. There were seventeen boxes of cleats or shoes. That might have been some Air Jordans in there too. Fifteen of them were Nike, and there were two Under Armors. I mean, he and there were almost. Uh, almost all of them were 12 and a half and a couple of 12. So maybe be trying, you know, a couple of different yeah. shoes, but 17 boxes. They were each stacked on at his locker of shoes. Oh, that's just a young guy thing. It's, <laughs> I mean, it, it's like early in your career, all this free stuff's falling in your yeah. lap, you know, the beats headphones, you got all this stuff. piled yeah. out. You, you start getting old. You just want less stuff. Yeah. You know, it's like, what do I do? You, want, you don't want the crap? clutter. The, the clutter just drives you nuts, but the and, young guys, man, it's so fun when you start, there's this, uh, Go ahead. And the Nike guys, especially because they Nike will give them Air Jordans. You know, they get to do the lifestyle shoes as well. Well, it's um, it's so they Nike. all got Air Jordans sitting there. Nike has this website you can log into. So that's like when you come back from a road trip during the season. Yeah. If you get there before that, you look in guys' lockers, and it's like you know everybody. You see which guys have been on the Nike. I think it's right. Nike Elite's the website, but it's their merch site. So however much. If you have like a Nike deal, say, you know, for a reliever, they give me like five or 10 grand Nike merch. Uh -huh. Like one year I had 20 grand in Reebok and I wound up, I mean, I was buying treadmills and selling them on Craigslist just to, <laughs> just to, trying to, spend, the just money. to spend all the, the Reebok merch. Like if you went to the outlet at Reebok, you could yeah. fill up five shopping carts and you're only 600 <laughs> bucks deep. You know, so you start wanting less stuff. But with Nike, their stuff's pretty cool. Uh, but guys will, you know, get on that website. And if the new Jordans come out, you know, it's like people are camping out for these things. If you log on to the Nike website that day, they're going to be there and you can get three pairs. And now you've got your pairs, but that's usually, it's just guys buying a bunch of stuff for themselves. And then, you know, a couple things from whoever their supplier is for the season. Uh, if anybody was wondering, uh, Austin Riley's car shield deal was not renewed. Uh oh, I, I asked him, it's a one year deal. They did not renew it. And I told that? him, I said, I think they've gone in a different direction because they seem like they've kind of gone all hip hop dudes, rap guys, because they're all they have the commercial where they're sitting around like at a barber shop and it's iced tea. And it's a bunch What's of these Car dudes. Shield. Car Shield is that you haven't seen those commercials? No. Iced tea commercials and is that it's it's a car uh, uh, a, a warranty thing. Warranty. Oh, it's like okay. a warranty for your car. They'll replace. They say. But Austin had a commercial and all with that. Austin Riley was a, was a car shield guy last year. And, uh, and, and, and I said, are you the car shield guy? He said, no, they didn't renew me, man. But I said, I, said, I think ass, with that huh? new contract, I think you could probably afford AAA or just yeah. buy a new car if it breaks down anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's another thing. Those, those type of things that are happening early on in your career, 
before you He's, get that big contract. Like, yeah, I'll, do the, I'll do the car shield commercial. Yeah. You know, maybe they give them a thousand bucks, a thousand bucks here, a thousand bucks there. It's like, it's a no brainer, but then you sign two, 200, whatever you signed. It's kind of like, yeah, car shield can, they can wait. You know, I don't, I don't really need them. I'm get through this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, he had that. They actually gave him the guarantee. They let him use car shield. I said, do they give you car shield for life? At least he goes, no, nope, just One while year. you represent. <laughs> <laughs> anyway um yeah so this is a good time man a good time before things get tense before anybody gets hurt before you know the stuff crops up but just as just all positive and optimism and all that but especially when a team's won five straight division titles it's yeah. like you get in a normal circumstances one if the Braves had not won five straight division titles and they're in a division with a team that's got the largest payroll in history yeah i mean Matt's got a 300 and some million dollar payroll, like close to 500 million with the taxes added on. I mean, it yep. blows away any payroll anybody's ever had. And yeah. The Phillies just went to the world series. So under normal circumstances, I think you might hear a lot more, you know, we'll see that kind of thing. And that's yeah, going to be tough, but it, you still see the same confidence from these guys. When you talk to them, they're, they're like, if they're affected by it or they're at all worried, they're sure not showing it because they sound to me like they are as confident as ever. Yeah, those are good teams. It's gonna be a real tough division again. We like our team. Yeah, I mean, you you went you five straight, you went to the World Series, then you won it, and then last year, okay, you get knocked out early. But it why wouldn't you be confident if you're them and feel good about yeah. it? And yeah. and you know, especially if you buy into and you know how much the things that we were talking about earlier, like the chemistry and the clubhouse and the yeah. vibe and all that you matters. can't buy that stuff. Can't go buy that. So you know you have something that that other teams don't. Maybe they're trying to build it and they might have it soon, but you know you're the best at that right now and you've won the division five years in a row. I mean, yeah, you're coming into camp confident. I did have a couple of them tell me, and it said last year too, but the, the, the urgency there is this year, uh, or not urgency, but the importance of avoiding another bad start because they've done it two years in a row and they reeled guys in and said that we can't do that this year with the Phillies coming off the World Series. You know, they're going to have confidence with the Mets, you know, spend all that money. They expect to go out. You can't let them get out of blocks and get too big a lead. So the Braves, they seem to know more, that it's more important this year, even though they've done it, overcome those deficits. We can't, they said, we can't keep gambling and doing that. So it's important we get off to a good start. And I think it was Mentor was telling me, What's great about having such a deep rotation is it's not going to put that burden on the bullpen or it shouldn't have right. that it did last year. Remember how much the bullpen, the innings were piling up and guys were getting used a lot. They were pitching great, but they really yeah. were having to pitch a lot because the rotation was still unsettled until they moved Strider in there. You know, in June, fifth starter was a disaster last year. A couple of the guys struggled early. Uh, 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 Charlie was coming off that leg, yeah. broken leg, and a bat and an off-season spent rehabbing. So he struggled really a lot in the first month, yeah. and, month and a half. So all these guys are healthy now. Charlie's coming off a normal off-season. Max, you know, he's driven. He always is, but especially after going through arbitration again. You got Strider, is Strider is a freak. I mean, he's gonna yep. look continue what he did last year. And Kyle Wright, he's one led the league and win, so he's confident now. And that's all he lacked before. Then you got the fifth starter guys that are, you know, really driven like Ian Anderson saying this go time is first time yeah. in the last couple of years. Haven't really been like that. Cause he's come to spring yeah. training with a job. With a already. job. Yeah. This year he goes, this go time, man, I got to come out from day one pitching. Yeah. Great. They got him and Soroka who are living together. They got him. Their lockers are side by side. Max free beside them. The Charlie beside them in that corner. So, I mean, if there's anything left for them to learn and or, or you know advice on overcoming obstacles, which you know, Soroka's trying to come back from something nobody's ever come back from. Ian's come back trying to come back from a really bad season, getting demoted. They got two guys right there that have overcome everything. You know, Max Fried's gone through Tommy John, and now he's a Cy Young runner-up. Charlie went through everything before he he didn't get good until he was in his thirties. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know. So. Those were those kind of I was asking Snit about that today. What Charlie means to this team, other than giving you 180 innings and you know 220 yeah. strikeouts or whatever, uh, and, and reliability. What he means to this team, and he goes, those guys are resources, man. To, yes, you know, they not are. just for the young guys, but for everybody to just come. Quiet. He said Charlie's quiet, but he'll talk. He talks to everybody, and he talks about what he's been through and what to look for and all that. He goes, you can't. Those those are really valuable guys to have on a team. 
No, I think that Charlie, especially, it it means even more, you know, to a young starter, a, a guy struggling or, or or something like that. It means more when a, this guy struggled too. You yeah. know, it's like when you got a guy who was a first round pick, top pick in the draft. He was up in the big leagues at twenty one and maybe had a rough season or two, but he's been in the big league, like Garrett Cole. Right. You know, if you had Garrett Cole talking to you or Charlie Morton, you know, a lot a lot of guys are going to be able to relate a lot more to Charlie who went through right. years of struggles in the big leagues, you know, and 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 you know, it's nothing against Garrett Cole. He's, I'm sure he's got sure. great advice too, but it just it makes Charlie so much more relatable how much he struggled and the stuff he went through to get where he's at and then how good he got from right. where he started. Or a DeGrom or Scherzer who in their own ways yeah. are freaks, you know. Yeah, like, they're not they're really unique guys. I mean, that's why I say hall of famers aren't always the best coaches. Right. It's like, you know, you can come up with this thing that worked for you. It's like, you could have come up with any concept and it probably would have worked for you. Cause you, you know, you were destined to hit 600 homers. Yeah. It's like what Frenchie and at, said Chipper used to, when he and BMAC came up and Chipper yeah. would tell him, do this. Why aren't you doing that? And they'd be like, it's easy we for can't. you to say, man, we can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But so, Hey, do you happen to see, by the way, D. Rowe, who one of the one of his, I think, might be his assistant hitting coach or bench coach, where who who one of his coaches is? B. Mac. Uh, B. Mac's a coach on the WBC team. Oh, okay. For okay. D. Rowe. Yeah, they're like nice. best buddies, man. Live live oh, near yeah. each other and all that. They they hang out every night. That's gonna be they're fun to watch. See what D. Rowe does with that team. He's got a hell of a team. Pitching yeah. staff is not as deep as the as Dominican and Puerto Rico. Venezuela. That's what's t- that's that's a big deal too because when you play the Latin American teams, yeah. they've all been hitting. So yeah. you can't like when you throw your your guy that's trying to get ready for camp and he's yeah. got a C game. Yeah, these guys have been hitting guys A games down in Venezuela or Dominican for three months already. Yeah, yeah. The 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 U.S. got a hell of a team, including Trout. I can't believe he's playing, but those guys haven't been playing winter ball. And that does it. And, and as and as great as as the experience was for those guys who played on the team last time, I don't think they go into it as with the importance that those Latin American countries feel. In Japan, this is really really big yeah. for like the Dominican, Puerto Rico. The U.S. should have said, "Man, Puerto Rico is part of the U.S. We get Puerto Rican guys on our team." <laughs> yeah, because that team would be favored to win it all. Yeah, they're tough. Puerto Rico and U.S. together. Yeah. But yeah, the Dominican team and Japanese team, because Japanese team, their infield, I guess, have been playing together a lot, yeah. years and years. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be tough for the U.S. to do a lot of damage, but we'll see. They got some. That's they got a hell of a roster. Well, you know the last the last few times they've done it. I, I don't think the first one was that entertaining for me, but as it's progressed, yeah, and and teams have gotten to the point where they're, you know. I'm kind of old school in a lot of ways, but a lot of the antics and stuff going on, it's not the big leagues and it's not the, that the, a lot of the stuff happening in the tournament and see yeah. how much those guys care, especially when the Latin teams match up. Yeah. In Miami. In my, it's so much fun to watch that atmosphere in that place with the dome shut. It'll probably be shut is going to be, cause they said yep. last time there, it was crazy how loud yep. it got in there. Yep. And somebody that's the pool, the pool of death, like in soccer, man, you got, <laughs> yeah. One of those teams is not going to come out of there. Nope. They should have divided that thing up. But you got, what, Dominican, Venezuela, and Puerto Rico all in the same one, right? Yeah, and they're going to duke it out. Wow. They, they, that's what I, I really do love and appreciate that the players haven't just looked at this thing as, you know, like one of those Japan tours you do in November yeah. after the season. Oh, yeah. Like, guys, guys take it serious, and they're yeah, trying it's to it's not win. an exhibition. It's it's, it's like, cool though, like guys like Trout and stuff. Uh, it's it'd be great if the American team does that too. Yeah, the worst thing to happen if this Trout goes and like I know tears his calf or something, you know, it'd be like, know. okay, nobody's ever gonna play again. Well, that's what everybody's afraid of, you know. The right. one year that the one year I got asked to be on the team, I think was 2012 or 13, and I already knew I had a torn ligament in my elbow. So I got a I got an email from Joe Torrey, I think it was, and he said, you know, we'd love to have you on the team. Are you interested in all? And I'm like, yeah. You know, I'd love to have that jersey to hang up later, yeah. and it'd be a great experience. But yeah. I'm trying to make it through this season without blowing yeah. out. I should have gone because I blew out anyway. Yeah, the pitchers. I was talking to Snit about it, and he's like, "All the teams, if your pitchers are in it, you're really worried. You do not want. They can't stop them from being in it, and they right. but, and they and they they really aren't are told not to even 
not to even try to dissuade them from doing it, but right. they do not want their pitchers no. going. Nobody does. You know, and it's such a big deal for the Latin American pitchers that some of them are like, oh, I'm pitching. Yeah. But the U American pitchers, you can tell it's a little different because look at the guys going. It's mostly the Kershaws and the older guys that – if I they blow can, out, just take and they me can out totally the manage it too. And, yeah. They can totally manage it. You know, yeah. if they're going to go three innings or whatever. If they're yeah. a little sore, nobody's going to ask. They're going to say, "I've got this." And it's a little different than than you see some of the studs that are going out there for some of those Latin American teams. And Is the team, going? Their major league teams? Hell no! Come on, <laughs> that would be insane. <laughs> But some I of those would the team be if some of those guys showed up, though. Oh, I know. Shit. If they had Scherzer, DeGrom, the whole shebang, yeah. Freed everybody. But uh, yeah, throwing those high pressure innings this time of the season, yeah, this time of the year, and you get worked up. That's woof, that's asking a lot. It's different for position guys, man. Yeah. As long as they're in shape and they've been working out in the winter. You know, yeah, with them, you're just more worried about a collision or or right. just, you know, an actual physical freak injury, but not, right. you know, overexertion leading to torn ligament or shoulder injury or something like right. that. Right, because they'd be playing games here anyway in spring yeah. training. You know, you could just as easily get hurt here. You know, it's not like you, you're you jogging, uh, you know, when you're when you, uh, you yeah. do a double play here, you know, you're maybe not deserting yourself full strength, but still. Uh, it's going to be interesting anyway. That's a couple of weeks. Uh, Acuna's jacked up. He's fired up about playing, man. He said when the Braves told him it was like the greatest thing when they said you can play. He was like so happy for his family and everybody wanted him to play. He said to put on that Venezuela jersey, it's going to be just like putting on a Braves jersey. How happy, how proud he is to do it. You know, every time he gets to see, he said, first time I put that Venezuela jersey on, man, it's a big deal. So, oh, I bet. I bet it felt, you know, I always thought that too. You know, it feels so good to put on a jersey that said USA on the front. You know, you get to play for your country. It's and and especially because uh, you know he's kind of viewed as with Miggy retiring, if he goes back to being what he was before the injury, Acuna right. is like going to be the face of Venezuelan baseball. Baseball yeah. man, like the most prominent hitter for, in Venezuela. Wow! So it's a big deal, man. Big deal. That's why it was such a big deal when they let him play in the winter ball. You know, here it's right. like, oh, yeah, he's playing. Down there, it was a big story of yeah. you playing. And then when he pimped that home run, it was on the road. <laughs> well, that's it's it's going to be just like that, you know, in the, in the in the WBC, those games. They'll be yeah. doing some, some crazy stuff. Because, you know, when they started kind of running on the field and celebrating and all that, it was still – it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't tolerated in MLB right. yet. Right. But they were like, "This is an MLB. We're doing it. Yeah, you know, we we're do doing. What we do back time. home." So it, then, after that, you know, the floodgates kind of opened. After that, yeah. I think it's for me. It's fun to watch. Um, just last couple of things. Rule changes. The bigger bases, man. They really are a lot bigger. If you see the if you see the juxtaposition, or you see one put on the other, um, the difference. I saw Harold Reynolds demonstrating today. Like if you dive back, for instance, the difference is it's like a full hand, man, yeah. close to it, you know? And if you just look at the number of bang, bang plays there are, it's got to make a difference. And also I was talking to Snit. How about the bang, bang plays at first base though? Because in a way, if you think about how much further now the first baseman is going to be to stretch, he's going to have this much. Oh more. yeah. Yeah. So, that, think about the number of bang bang plays at first base. There, there are at least four or five in every game that they have every to go game. to the replay and it looks Pick like plays. almost a tie yeah. or whatever. Well, if the if the first baseman has got that much further reaching out, it's also going to counter a little bit of that. Yeah, so, I, I didn't think of that because I was all thinking of it of, of helping the offense, right. but yeah, that could hurt them in a sense. Right, and because it's cutting down the distance between first and second, so once they get there, stolen bases should be up. I mean, there's there's really. I don't see how they wouldn't be. It's going to be four and a half inches closer between the bases. Well, that's I just, a, I a lot of that. stolen bases are decided by less than four and a half inches. Yeah, I just wonder what the analytics and everything is going to say about the risk of it, you know, because it seems like it's just nobody does it anymore. Yeah, we're going to have to see it play out. But the Braves yeah. are one of those teams. They got they got multiple guys that can Yeah, steal. they have some threats. If these guys are all healthy and they're all playing every day, I could definitely see Ozzy. Harris, Acuna, and Grissom. If you look at Grissom's minor league stolen base numbers, before he got called up last year, he was like 27 or something out of 31 or something like really? that. 
something like that. If you look at a, that's four guys that could legitimately steal if they're playing every day, 25, 25 or 30, more bases. Yeah. And a couple of them could get over 30. I mean, Acuna got 37 that year as a, as first full season for a rookie year when he blew his ham, he hurt his hamstring and couldn't run at all the last week and a half, or he would have got 40, 40 that year. Yeah. I'd, so, I'd rather not see him chase stuff. I know. Like that. <laughs> I know. He's the guy that you're like, okay, just, uh, you know, yeah. but you know, you know how he is though. He's going to be going. I know. It's, and it's hard to take that away from him because that's what makes him good. And honestly, you know? the same way, dude, because he is so inclined with those head first steals and had such yeah. a little dude, <laughs> so inclined to break some, it seems like, or hurt some. You're like, is it really worth it? I don't know, but they're going to do it. I know they'll do it. And I know we saw we saw Harris do it last year. Yeah. You don't worry about him so much. He's a big, strong guy. I mean, yeah, he's. I think he, I think I would expect to see – I mean, he stole, what, 20 out of 20 before he got caught? 19 out of 19. Then got caught a couple times at the end. But he's he 6'1", 225. 225. He said about six feet. I asked him. I said, are you doing 6'2"? He goes, no, nah, about six feet. He that's said 225. Thick. So Yeah, that's a that's a running back. Yeah. He's built like a little taller Ricky Henderson, man. Is you he? You know, with the legs. and Ricky, I think, is only like 5'9", right? 5'10", the most. <laughs> Richie, R- Ricky's still jacked, too. Oh, he had yeah. A lo- he had a locker in the Oakland clubhouse. He He'd be in there, you know, working out and doing stuff. Yeah. It's just having those mean, bodies, just man. Jacked at 50, you know, whatever age he is now. He looked like he was in better shape than 90% of us. But it's going to be interesting because the Braves, it's almost like they designed the team. They didn't, but it's almost like they designed the team with these rules in mind because they got those four guys that can steal a lot of bases. And you add a catcher who's maybe the second best catcher in a game at, at, at defensively. Because Murphy is going to. What about the shift? He's got a hose, and he is the pop time is second fastest in the ba- in baseball to Real Muto. Oh, it is second fastest pop time last year. And he hits. And he could, it, dude. Watching him take BP, that dude. Yeah. People are going to be surprised. I think. You well, get him moving, out of Oakland, out of that, that big park to, Yeah, and he, that lineup. He's in great shape too. This is a guy with one of those, the, like Andre Dawson. The shoulders are like. It's a he's an impressive guy. Yeah, I think it's it's it'll be a really big change for him going from from that stadium in Oakland where I mean just this the effect it can have on you to to square a ball up and have it warm, you know wind up at the track. Yeah, start swinging a little harder, get out of your approach, start hitting in the summer at Truist, and you miss yeah. a ball and it still gets two rows deep. It's like that. What that could do for your confidence is crazy. Yeah, I expect big things from him. I think he's got a, whatever happened last year with the DH. He had like 30 DH games. His numbers weren't good as a DH, but that might have been just one of those fluky things. But he should be a little more used to DH and after doing it last year. Yeah. Because he's going to be doing it plenty, I think, this year. We'll see. Have, what about the shift? How do you think that's going to affect guys? It could help Olsen a lot. They've, they've stressed to them, too, how they're not going to, because they know teams are going to try to, would try to cheat it if they're not, if they don't, if they don't uh, stay on top of it. They're not going to allow like guys to take off running when the pitch is, you know, when the guys right. deliver the pitch, and they're not they're going to be watching all that stuff and penalize teams that try to do it. So they're going to have to stay there until the pitch is delivered, and not just you know run to where they would have been shifted. I saw a I saw a picture of a, a possible way around it. The right fielder and center fielder were basically covering right center and left center, and the third baseman was in charge of if there was a ball hit down the left field line, running out there and getting it. And the left fielder was was back in shallow right center, helping out the two infielders. It was huh. – uh, I'd have to post the picture for it to even That'd make be sense. But they're already at work trying to find ways around this. And you got to think, as with the analytics experts and all that. They're They'll gonna, say it's worth it. If there's a way to stupid. do it, they're going to try it. Yeah. They'll try it. Especially yeah. teams that are out of it or whatever or don't have great defensive – I think the Braves, man, with with Harris and now with a healthy Acuna right and with Harrison center, obviously somebody's going to have to be emerge in left field. But if Rosario is healthy, but that you know one of the one of the newcomers like Eli White would be better there if they're playing. But um, I don't know. We're going to see with Grissom not being able to shift. Yeah, it's going. He's going to be put to the test right away. You know. Well, it's he's working Dansby. with Wash. I feel good about him working with Wash. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. not April or May, but I'd say if he gets a full year working with Washington by 
by September, people will be saying some pretty nice things about yeah. his defense. Yeah. I like the right side with Ozzy healthy and with Olsen. Yeah. yeah. Olsen struggled a little at times last year initially, but over the course of the season, we saw how good he is defensively. So. You know, the thing that caught me off guard was the balls he was just dropping that were hitting him in the glove. It happened like five right, times. Right, the routine, yeah. Big, big moments, but then he'd make a sick play. Yeah, that was you weird, know? man. It was just and a he, weird thing that happened. And he really didn't have an explanation for it either. He's like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I really wish it stopped, though. <laughs> you know, like that's one of those things that you're just like, fuck, I don't. I think it might have happened a couple of times, and then he just got a little anxious, you know, so yep. it didn't happen, it wouldn't happen again, and closing his yep. glove too fast, and that yep. kind of thing. It turns into a thing, then it sucks. But. All right, well, we'll do another of these next week after the breaks, after after we see some guys throw and uh, see what's going on, how, how some guys look, that kind of thing. Ooh. But uh, it's here. Yeah, it comes fast. Yeah, and it's going to be twice as long as last year. Last year, man, three and a half weeks they got that thing in. That's how long it should be every year. Yeah. I know the they guys that need the extra time of the pitchers. But just tell the pitchers to come in ready for games. Right. Day three. Right. Start throwing some at home to get, you know, the innings get worked up a little bit. I mean, yeah. and some of the starters really they need that time either. Yeah. Yeah. I needed I, – I felt like I needed five games. So, you know, like showing up. 20 days before camp ended. Maybe you can alleviate some people's concerns because I, I, I reported yesterday, I found out Jimenez actually had needed ended up having back surgery for the lumbar strain that he had that shut down a season in late September with Detroit. They didn't think it was going to have the surgery, but he did probably because, you know, it was, it was a less, it was a non-invasive thing. It wasn't bad. You know, they went in and did it. He's been throwing now for, for a while. He came here. He's already doing the full schedule, throwing and all that. Snit said, oh yeah, he'll be ready. It's not even a big deal. He's throwing, throwing bullpens, everything. I think people hear back surgery and they say, oh, there's no way he's going to be ready. But it wasn't. Well, it's different it open. It was an arthr arthroscopic and go in and just do whatever they had to do to fix the strain. Yeah, Moylan's been talking, trying to talk me into having one of those because he's had a couple. And he says you walk out of there like nothing yeah. happened. He's like, you know, you got to be careful for a month. You know, pick up your kids and throw them around. But it's it's pretty much nothing now. The little cleanups. Right. And as a reliever, you know, honestly, if, if he's already doing full camp, Right, and, uh, full activities. You only need five games. Right, you, that's what I said. It's not be. like a starter, I, no. but especially a veteran reliever. You don't right. need that many innings no. to get sharp and get ready. No. They'll be ready. And if he's not, you know, if if you have to, you get so many off days early in the season. If you have to, you know, play it a little safe with him, you can right. use him when you really need him. And especially it helps when you're in a bullpen like the Braves have got with the depth <laughs> they've got. Uh, damn, yeah. we're stuck with Minter again today. You know, yeah. it's like whatever. Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, watching. And uh, we'll be back here, same channel. We'll, start, we'll do at least one of these every week during spring training before we move into the two a week. When the season during starts. The season. Yep. All right. That's it. 755 is real. And it's still real. 755. Always real. I, I saw a lot of Hank when I was at the Hall of Fame last week, man. It was great seeing all that stuff up there. What a guy. All right, we're out. Thanks, All everybody. Right.